<clears throat> Thank you very much, Vice Chancellor, ladies and gentlemen. Ah. Okay, yes. <laughs> right. If you were to take 10,000 people at random, 9,999 would have something in common. Their business lies on or near the surface of the earth. And the oddball will be an astronomer. And I'm one of that small minority. In fact, uh, if you were to do the survey not in a random place on Earth, but in King's Parade, you'd find a slightly higher proportion of astronomers, uh, maybe one in 1,000 or one in 500, because uh, Cambridge is, I'm glad to say, one of the places where astronomers are heavily concentrated. We are one of the world's centres for astronomy, and I'm privileged to be uh, part of this community. So uh, with that, uh, let me emphasize that astronomy is not just for astronomers. I think it's important that uh, the night sky is something which has fascinated uh, people from the dawn of humanity. We've all had different environments to grow up in, but we all look at the same night sky and wondered about it, interpreted in different ways. So the night sky is part of our environment, um, and uh, it's something that we have all uh, wondered about. And also, it's part of our culture to understand astronomy and uh, its nature. And we now know uh, that our origins lie in the stars and that our remote descendants may roam among them. And I'll ask in this lecture, what were the features of our universe that allowed stars and planets to form and which led on this planet to the emergence of our biosphere, where, in the famous words of Darwin, the closing words of our the species, whilst this planet has been cycling on, according to the fixed law of gravity, from so simple a beginning, forms most wonderful have been and are being evolved. Well, astronomers tried to go back before Darwin's simple beginning to set the Earth and the atoms that it was made of in a broader context. And we also want to ask the question, could there be life elsewhere? But before that, I want to say a few words about uh, uh, whether human life is going to go into space. Are we going to go uh, beyond the Earth ourselves? And people for centuries have speculated about that. And among them was uh, the great Isaac Newton, probably the uh, most eminent alumnus of this uh, university. Um, and uh, uh, he um, speculated about life in space. He was, incidentally, um, a most unattractive personality, quite unlike Darwin. He was um, solitary and obsessive when young, vain and vindictive in his old age. Uh, so he wouldn't have been attractive, although on an IQ test he'd have beaten almost anyone else hands down. And he was the first, really, to think about how, in Darwin's phrase, planets go cycling on in orbit. This is a nice picture taken from the English translation of his great book, The Principia. You can see what's happening. Uh, um, a cannon is firing uh, a projectile from a mountain top, and if it's fired fast enough, then the uh, trajectory curves downwards no faster than the Earth curves away underneath it. It goes into orbit. This, I think, is still the neatest way to explain uh, to uh, uh, beginners the nature of orbital flight. It's quite easy to understand here. Now, Newton could have calculated that to go into orbit, the cannon has to fire the projectile at 18,000 miles an hour. Far, far beyond, of course, the capacity of the cannon of his time. And, as most of you know, it wasn't until 1957 that the Sputnik went up into orbit. And after that things move very fast. It was only 12 years later that we got views like this from people orbiting uh, the, the moon. And uh, the moon landing was 12 years after Sputnik, only 66 years after the Wright brothers' first flight. And most of us probably then expected that by now there would have been a lunar base, maybe an expedition to Mars, but that hasn't happened. 2001 didn't resemble Arthur C. Clarke's vision any more than, fortunately, 1984 resembled Orwell's. 
That's because the political impetus for manned space flight was lost after the Apollo venture. And only the middle-aged can remember seeing live on TV Neil Armstrong's first small steps. Young people today, indeed, uh, know that the Americans landed on the moon just as they know the Egyptians built the pyramids. But both enterprises may seem driven by equally arcane national goals. But it was a heroic episode, and I'm rather proud to have this uh, um, picture signed by seven of the Apollo astronauts. And since that time, hundreds of astronauts have uh, not been to the moon, but they've circled the Earth, many in this space station. Activities that compared to Apollo seem perhaps neither very inspiring nor very practical. But despite this sort of languishing of manned space flight, unmanned probes to other, to other planets have revealed varied and distinctive worlds. And let me show you first a few pictures of Mars. Uh, this is a, a picture of the surface of Mars. And here are some taken from uh, uh, the European Space Agency's Mars Express. This is a big crater. Um, and uh, the next picture is going to show a close-up of the side of the crater there. A slightly terrestrial-looking landscape, but you can see that Mars has very uh, interesting uh, terrain indeed. And uh, this is the Phoenix uh, uh, spacecraft which landed on Mars a couple of uh, years ago. Uh, this is going to dig down to a depth of about a metre uh, to uh, analyse uh, the sample. Uh, not to bring it back to Earth, of course, but to analyse it in situ. And, of course, space probes have been further. Uh, here's Jupiter. It's moons, first discovered by Galileo, of course. Uh, this is um, Europa, uh, which is a close-up of Europa. It's got uh, almost certainly oceans under this deep ice. Here's Saturn, um, a spacecraft called Cassini uh, went to Saturn a few years ago and it's still orbiting around, taking close-ups of all the moons. And one of the most remarkable outcomes of this uh, was the exploit of a European robotic probe called Huygens, which was released from Cassini. And what it was supposed to do was to land on Titan, which is the giant moon of Saturn, the biggest uh, uh, moon in the solar system, uh, it was supposed to um, open a parachute and land on a surface about which we knew very little. And it did just that. Here, the left and in the middle, are pictures taken on the way down. There on the right is where it landed. Now, this looks uh, rather like terrestrial um, uh, topography, rivers, and even a little lake. But there's a difference um, these uh, rivers are liquid methane. The temperature is minus 170 degrees uh, centigrade. And those, those little rocks are solid methane, probably. So no sort of beachfront property there. It's not a very comfortable place. But uh, this is a remarkable achievement because this robot, it was being controlled from Earth because uh, a radio signal takes hours to get uh, to Saturn and back. So for the last two weeks, when it was released from Cassini, this uh, uh, craft was on its own. This is a great triumph of technology that it did this. Well, I hope that during the next few decades, the entire solar system will be explored and mapped by flotillas of tiny robotic craft doing things like this on all the uh, objects in the solar system. But are people going to follow them? This shows Harrison Smith, the last man on the moon. The practical case for sending people into space is getting weaker all the time with each advance in robotics and miniaturization. Indeed, as a scientist or practical man, I see no case for sending people into space at all. But as a human being, I am quite an enthusiast for manned space missions. It is, I hope, some people now living will walk on Mars. It should be a long-range adventure for at least a few humans. But this goal is actually receding. NASA's firm plans don't even include a re return to the moon. I think that's really because NASA 
projects are always very expensive because they have to be uh, um, achieve very high safety standards uh, to uh, commit civilians to something like that. But I think, therefore, that uh, future expeditions to the moon and beyond will only be politically and financially feasible if they are cut price ventures, perhaps privately funded, accepting high risks, and perhaps spearheaded by individuals who will accept these risks and even one-way tickets with people who will do that. And perhaps it'll be private sponsorship, and I could talk a bit more about this afterwards. It's not crazy, I think, to do it that way. But it will be dangerous, and remember that nowhere in our solar system offers an environment even as clement as the Antarctic or the top of Everest. So it's uh, kidding yourself to think that uh, going into space is an escape from the Earth's problems. We've got to solve the Earth's problems here on Earth, not in space. But there could nonetheless, if we think a few centuries ahead, be self-sufficient groups of pioneers living away from the Earth. They would surely then use all the resources of genetic, genetic technology to modify themselves and their descendants to adapt to an alien environment of much lower gravity. The post-human era would then have begun and machines of human intelligence could then spread still further. And whether the future lies in the long run with organic post-humans or with robots is a matter for debate. Well, our Earth is very tiny, but it could therefore be the seed from which life could spread through the galaxy in the very long run. But let's now widen our gaze beyond our solar system, far beyond the reach of any probe we can now conceive. It would take tens of thousands of years for any probe to actually get to even the nearest star. So could there be life out there already among the stars? What about the stars themselves? We've learnt enough about stars to understand them, their life cycle. We see places where stars are forming. Here in the Eagle Nebula, about 7,000 light years away, there's enough dusty gas to form hundreds of new stars uh, like our sun and solar systems. And we see stars dying. This is what our sun will look like in six billion years. Here's another star dying in a rather messy way, as it were, here. And some stars, particularly big stars, die rather explosively. This is a famous object called the Crab Nebula, uh, which is the exploding debris from a supernova explosion witnessed by Chinese astronomers in the year 1054 AD. A star flared up then, and we now see this exploding debris. You might think that uh, these dying stars far away are irrelevant to us, but were it not for these exploding stars, we wouldn't be here. The reason for that is that stars derive their energy by nuclear fusion. They start with hydrogen and helium, and they gain energy by turning hydrogen to helium, then helium into carbon, into oxygen, into iron, and so on. And then, when they die, they throw it all back into interstellar space, and new stars form from it. And in fact, I'm not going to explain all this diagram, but there's a sort of uh, uh, ecology going on in interstellar space, uh, where uh, new stars form, and then when they die, they throw back material into space, and that space is uh, uh, enriched with the uh, um, uh, heavy elements of the periodic table, which are uh, made during the lifetime of the star, and then they ma make new stars. And we can understand enough about this to understand why oxygen and carbon are common, Gold and uranium are rare, and how they came to be in our solar system. We know that every atom in our bodies was made in a star which died before our solar system formed. We know indeed that we have inside each of us atoms that came from thousands of different stars spread through the entire Milky Way. So we are uh, literally the ashes of long dead stars, or if you're less romantic, we are nuclear waste from the fuel that made stars shine. And I'd like to put in a plug for Fred Hoyle, who is, in fact, uh, uh, my predecessor as uh, 
Plumer Professor of Astronomy here, and he was the person who, more than anyone else, uh, explained and quantified this wonderful story, which shows that uh, we are linked to the stars in an even more intimate way than the astrologers think. We are actually made of stardust. And all the atoms that we are made of do have this history which we can trace back to far earlier times than when the Earth was formed. We've now, in just the last 10 years or so, learned something which makes the night sky much more interesting than it was to our forebears. We've learned that most of the stars we see in the sky aren't just twinkling points of light. They're orbited by planets, just as our sun is orbited by the planets we are familiar with, including the Earth. Most of these planets aren't detected directly. They're detected in the fashion indicated here. If a star is orbited by a planet, then what actually happens is that both the star and the planet orbit around the centre of mass of the system. It's called the barycenter. The planet moves in an, its orbit. The star, being heavier, moves in a much smaller orbit. And even if it's not possible to observe the planet, it has proved possible to observe the small motions of a star induced by an orbiting planet. And by this method, in the last 10 years, several hundred stars have been observed to have planets around them. And it's possible to infer the mass of the planet and to infer its orbital period. Don't worry about the details, but I just uh, put up here on this slide, this is a list of stars which are inferred to have at least two planets discovered this way by sort of Fourier analysis of the motions of the, of the star. And there's one star which is known to have at least five planets uh, found in this way. Now, most of the planets found in this way are big planets. They're rather like... Uh, Jupiter and Saturn, the giants of our solar system. It's not possible by this indirect technique to uh, um, find a planet like the Earth because that would induce a motion of only a few centimetres per second in the star it's orbiting and that centimetre per second motion is too small to detect by the methods used. But there is another way which is going to, uh, within the next year or two, uh, tell us how many Earth-like planets there are orbiting other stars. And this is uh, being done mainly by uh, a spacecraft called Kepler, which was launched in March last year. What Kepler is doing is it's uh, looking at the same part of the sky continuously. It's looking at a, a region seven degrees across, and it's look, measuring the brightness of 100,000 stars in that part of the sky with a precision of better than one part of 10,000, and doing that every half hour. And what it's looking for is a transit by a planet. Because supposing that there's a, a star and there's a planet and the plane of the orbit is um, along our line of sight, and if the planet moves across in front, it blocks out a bit of the starlight and the uh, brightness of the star will dip a bit, as shown, as shown there. And if you have an Earth-like planet orbiting a Sun-like star, uh, then just the ratio of the areas, it's about one in 10,000. So the dip is just one part in 10,000. But the Kepler mission um, ought to be able to detect that. And uh, um, in order to be sure you've seen a planet, uh, then you've got to see three of these uh, um, dips occurring regularly. And uh, if it's like the Earth going around the sun, that's going to take three years. And so we have to wait a year or so before we, we get uh, some data from Kepler on Earth-like planets. But it'll come and uh, that'll uh, uh, give us an indication for how many planets there are that are closer to the size of the Earth than to the size of Jupiter. Now, this is still a bit unsatisfying because we're seeing the shadow of the planets, not uh, the planets themselves. But to detect an Earth-like planet orbiting another star is a much more challenging task. It's very challenging because, uh, let's imagine you were looking at our solar system from 50 light years away. This is the nearby star. Supposing some alien astronomers were out there looking at us. 
then from a distance of 50 light years, our sun would look a very ordinary star, and the Earth would look, in Carl Sagan's nice phrase, like a pale blue dot, about 10 billion times fainter than the sun, and separated from it by a tiny angle, fraction of an arc second. So the task is really like looking for a far fly next to a searchlight. It's a real challenge. You need sensitivity and resolution. And we have to wait some time until we have a rays like this in space or the next generation of telescopes like this on the ground. Look at the scale of a lorry there. Um, but one of these is being talked about to be built in the next 15 years. And they will be able to detect um, pale blue dots orbiting other stars that might be like the Earth. Now, once one of these can be detected, then you can learn a surprising amount about it. Because, again, suppose the alien astronomers were looking at our sun and our Earth. Then they would find that uh, the shade of blue would be slightly different depending on whether the Pacific Ocean or the landmass of Eurasia was facing them. So alien astronomers from 50 light years away could infer that the Earth had continents and oceans, the length of the day, something of the climate and the seasons, and perhaps by studying the reflected light that there was oxygen or ozone in the atmosphere. And that's the kind of thing we'd be doing uh, in about 20 years um, when we can detect Earth-like plans around other stars. And once we can find one, we can find zillions of them. So this would be a very exciting uh, development. Well, the next question, of course, is do we expect life on any of these? And this is a much more difficult question because uh, we know too little about how life began here on Earth to be able to say whether life is likely or unlikely. Of course, people are looking for evidence for life in our solar system uh, in all these sorts of places. No one's very optimistic. Uh, the best you might find on uh, Mars is sort of freeze-dried bacteria that lived a few billion years ago and now dead, and we don't hold out much hope elsewhere. But uh, on these other plants around other stars, then, of course, there may very well be life. There may very well be a biosphere. And it's obviously sensible to focus on Earth-like planets orbiting stars like the Sun. Some people, of course, um, have argued that our Earth is very special indeed. I um, won't go into this, but they've they said that we're, our Earth's uh, special. It's got a moon that's special and that Jupiter has to be there, etc. Um, but I think we mustn't be uh, too impressed by this sort of argument. I mean, we've evolved in symbiosis with our environment, and uh, we wouldn't be the way we are unless the uh, Earth had its properties. But that doesn't mean that uh, uh, there couldn't have been life in a rather different environment. Uh, we have clearly evolved um, to fit our environment, but uh, it's rather like saying, isn't it amazing that your legs are just long enough to reach the ground? It's not really amazing at all, um, and, uh, and it may not be amazing that uh, we fit our environment. And therefore, I think one should be open-minded and one should look for evidence of life on all other kinds of planets. And of course, science fiction uh, writers have given us all kinds of other ideas, floating creatures in the atmospheres of planets like Jupiter, or even creatures uh, uh, not on planets at all. And incidentally, I tell my students that uh, uh, it's uh, uh, a good stimulus to your imagination to read science fiction, and uh, um, first-rate science fiction is probably better than second-rate science in that it's more entertaining and perhaps uh, uh, no more likely to be wide of the mark. Um, mm -hmm. um, well, um, of course, even if simple life is common, then it's a separate question whether... Um, it develops into what we call advanced life, still less intelligent life. We don't know. Because there's a lot of debate, as you probably know, about whether if re evolution will rerun on the Earth, where you end up with human beings or not. You might end up with a planet covered with insects or something like that. We just don't know what's contingent and what is inevitable about evolution here on the Earth. Um, and so I think we have to be entirely open-minded and realize that uh, um, we don't understand uh, the origin of life on Earth. Of course, there are people who think they do know about uh, this, and uh, there have been UFOs here, and they've been visited and abducted. And I get letters from people like this um, in my Rose Astronomer Royal. I mean, I uh, do two things. I encourage them to write to each other. That's often a good move. <laughs> um, um, 
Uh, and also, I would say to them more seriously, do they really think that uh, if the aliens had made the effort to come to the Earth and had the technology to do this, would they just have uh, despoiled a few cornfields and made corn circles, met one or two well-known cranks and gone away again? It doesn't seem very likely. So I'm pretty convinced that we haven't yet uh, been visited by aliens, uh, but nonetheless... It's not crazy to believe that they may exist out there, and I think it's a good idea to use all possible methods to search for them. Well, of course, um, uh, there are, as you probably know, um, some efforts being made to uh, uh, look for sort of some sort of signals of the kind that might uh, emanate from uh, a planet where there is intelligent life. Um, and uh, uh, I don't hold my breath for success. I'm glad people are doing this, because, of course, to detect any manifestly artificial signal even if it was as boring as um, the digits of pi or um, a set of prime numbers or something, would carry the momentous message that uh, maths and logic, if not consciousness, was not limited to the hardware and human skulls, but it evolved somewhere else. So that would be crucially important. Would we have any common culture with uh, these aliens? Uh, well, actually we would. Um, because um, even if they live on planet Zog and have seven tentacles, uh, they would uh, be made of the same atoms as us. They'd gaze out if they had eyes on the same cosmos, and uh, the physics would be the same. So we would have something in common, um, and uh, my, maybe we could understand their messages. But, of course, um, we would uh, um, have plenty of time to think about sending a message back, because remember that the nearest such uh, life would be many light years away, and so it would take decades to send a signal, so there's no scope for a snappy repartee, as it were. Um, yeah. But, of course, there may not be anything out there. Perhaps all these searches will fail. It could be that Earth's intricate biosphere is unique, even if simple life is common elsewhere. And that may be disappointing to some people, but it would have its upside, because our tiny planet would then, small though it is, be perhaps the most important place in the galaxy, perhaps even a seed from which life could spread through the entire galaxy. But it's an old saying that uh, absence of evidence isn't evidence of absence, and there could, even if we don't detect anything, be intelligence is the leading contemplative lives out there, or so different from us that we couldn't recognize them at all. Well... That's a difficult subject because biology is very hard. I'm going to go back to the simplicities of the physical world, uh, but extend our gaze still further from our own Milky Way galaxy to other galaxies. If we were to get two million light years away from the sun and look back at our galaxy, we'd see something like this. This is, in fact, I'm sure most of you know, the Andromeda galaxy, our nearest neighbor in space, two million light years away, and it's a spinning disk viewed obliquely, almost edge on, where all the stars are orbiting around some central hub. And these galaxies are the basic building blocks of the large-scale universe. Here's another one, a disk viewed almost face on. You might ask, um, how can we astronomers um, understand uh, the nature of these, what they're made of, what their dynamics is, etc. We can't do experiments on them, of course, in a way that uh, particle physicists can crash particles together in an accelerator. But we can do experiments in the virtual world of our computer. We can ask what would happen if you crash two galaxies together. And here's a simple picture of what happens. Two galaxies are falling together. The gravitational pull of every star in one is actually on every other and you end up with a sort of mess like this. So that's a calculation. We then look in this sky, and, apart, and as well as the galaxies I showed you, we see galaxies like that. And it's a pretty fair assumption that what happened here is rather like what happened in that movie. Two galaxies have got dangerously close. The gravity of each one has pulled out a tidal stream on the others. And perhaps these, if we came back in 100 million years, would have merged completely. Because remember, that last movie was speeded up by about 10 to 15 from real time. Uh, so it's by doing these calculations with different assumptions about the mass and uh, uh, etc. that we can come to understand in quite a lot of detail galaxies. 
And, of course, we have huge numbers of galaxies to study. Uh, this is a, uh, um, a map, as it were, of all the galaxies within uh, a few hundred million light years of us. They're grouped together in clusters. Now, the one thing we know about galaxies um, is that uh, they're moving away from us. This is a famous expansion of the universe discovered by Edwin Hubble in the 1930s. And there's uh, Edwin Hubble, a heavy smoker there, as you can see. And he uh, was the person who uh, first realized that the galaxies were moving uh, apart from each other. What he found was what's symbolized here, that uh, um, the further away a galaxy is the faster it's moving from us, by, uh, symbolized by the longer arrows further away. Now, at first sight, when people are told this, they think this must mean that we are in some central position. But it doesn't mean that, as I can illustrate by this picture. Imagine this uh, infinite lattice, and imagine that uh, all the rods lengthen at a certain rate. Then if you sit on one of the vertices, then the other vertices will recede from you at a speed proportional to the number of intervening links. So the whole network will seem to expand. And that's quite a good way to visualize the expanding universe. If you imagine the galaxies linked together by rods and all the rods lengthen at the same time, uh, then uh, um, that, that's uh, going to give you the uh, law that Hubble discovered. There's just one thing which is not uh, um, fully represented in this picture and better by this second Escher diagram. This is Escher's uh, Angels and Devils. And uh, this extra effect stems from the fact that uh, light takes a long time to get to us from these distant galaxies, many billions of years in some cases. And so if we look a long way away, we're looking back in time to when the rods were shorter, when the lattice was more compressed. And so what we actually see when we look out into space and back in time is better represented by this picture here, when as we look far away, we see things as they were younger, and when everything is more closely packed together. And we can, in fact, look very far back indeed. Uh, this picture is taken with a very large telescope, and it shows a small patch of sky. It would take 100 patches like this one to cover the full moon in the sky, just a very small one. And it would look completely blank, looked at with a small telescope. But here, with a really big telescope, you see these several hundred smudges. Each of those smudges is a galaxy, many of them fully the equal of our galaxy or Andromeda, looking so small and faint because of the huge distance. And we're looking back at these galaxies to a time when they'd only recently formed. And in fact, if we study light from them, we can see they're not like our galaxy in two respects. First, they've got more gas in them, which hasn't yet made it into stars. And secondly, if you take the spectrum, you can see how much carbon, oxygen, etc. there is in them. And there's less than there is in a present-day galaxy because there hasn't been time for the uh, stars to make all those um, heavy elements uh, in, in this galaxy. And so uh, if we look at Andromeda, then maybe there are astronomers on Andromeda looking back at us, but... There are certainly no astronomers on these very distant galaxies because there's been no time uh, for the uh, elements to uh, be produced to make planets, which require lots of silicon, oxygen, and iron, etc., and so therefore the scant chance of life. But what about still earlier times, before the first galaxies formed? Uh, we are confident, and have been since the 1960s, that everything stopped started off in what we colloquially call the Big Bang. Everything was hot and dense. The best evidence for this uh, is uh, uh, symbolized in this picture here. Um, even intergalactic space is not completely cold. It's warmed to about three degrees above absolute zero by very weak microwaves. And these microwaves, if you observe them at different frequencies, they have uh, what physicists know as, as a black body spectrum, which is what you would expect if this radiation was produced in conditions like the centre of a star, where everything is very hot and dense. And as the universe expanded and cooled, this radiation shifted into the uh, infrared and then into the microwave band, 
uh, but it's still around, it fills the universe, it's got nowhere else to go. And this is a relic of the time when the universe was only a few seconds old. Well, when people are told that the universe started off as this sort of amorphous fireball, uh, one question they ask is, well, how did it get from that state to the present universe uh, where we have um, tremendous structures, we have stars and galaxies, etc. It may seem contrary to uh, the um, famous second law of thermodynamics which says that order gets washed out. But the reason that doesn't happen, it's the effect of gravity. What gravity does is that if there's a tiny density contrast, then as the universe expands, that a slightly overdense region lags behind more and more and eventually condenses out. And I'm going to show you another movie which shows a, uh, uh, a simulation of a region of the universe big enough to make several hundred galaxies. And uh, the expansion is being subtracted out, so everything is looking at the same scale. Um, and uh, um, if you look, the time is, is on the bottom there, and you see that structures are forming. The universe expands, density contrasts grow, and in perceptual initial fluctuations, eventually uh, condense out into um, what turn into galaxies today. So this is uh, the way in which we think an almost amorphous early universe uh, developed into, into galaxies. And we'd like, of course, to understand this in a lot of detail. Um, and uh, um, I'm just, I won't have time to go through this, but uh, uh, we can ask what did the universe have to be like to allow this transition from something that was initially featureless and dense to something which uh, developed structures and then developed planets and then eventually life. And uh, these are some of the prerequisites. I'll go through this fairly quickly. Well, there's got to be gravity to pull structures together, but it turns out that the weaker gravity is the better because uh, that allows very large structures to form. If gravity was much stronger, then objects as big as us would get crushed by gravity, which would not be good. So we want a very weak force of gravity. Uh, obviously, things must be in thermodynamic equilibrium. Uh, we've got to end up with some places which are hot and some which are cold. Um, we need to have um, matter-antimatter asymmetry because if we had equal amounts of matter and antimatter, then as the fireball cooled down, they'd annihilate, we'd have just radiation, no atoms. So we need that. And we also need what I call non-trivial chemistry. Uh, we need um, uh, fundamental laws such that the nuclear force and the electromagnetic force um, are in balance because in a complex atom like uh, uh, an atom, uh, a nucleus of oxygen, then it's a balance between the nuclear force holding it together, the electric forces tearing it all apart. So we need some sort of fine-tuning there. And, of course, we need stars to form, maybe second-generation stars, because the first-generation stars uh, make the... Uh, uh, the first chemical elements. And we also need the expansion to happen um, at a well-tuned rate, because if the universe was expanding too slowly, it would recollapse very quickly before there was time for anything to happen. If it was expanding so fast, then uh, structures wouldn't be able to pull themselves together because of gravity. So we have to understand this sort of well-tuned expansion rate. And we also uh, need to... Uh, postulate some non-zero fluctuations in the very early universe because if the universe started off completely smooth then it would now after 13 billion years be just cold neutral hydrogen no stars, no galaxies and no people so the challenge of uh, cosmology is to try and understand uh, why the universe was set up this way now the one thing we do uh, suspect is that uh, to answer that question, we have to go back not to the first second of the universe, but to the first tiny, tiny fraction of a second. And the problem there is that if you extrapolate back to the first tiny fraction of a second, everything gets hotter and hotter and denser and denser, and conditions are reached where we lose our foothold in experiment. The densities and energies are such that we can't produce them in the lab. The energies are far higher even than you can produce in the LHC at Geneva. And so we are in speculative territory. But the answers to the questions of why the universe is the way it is would only be found when we can go back very early on. Some people would say very far back indeed, to the first trillionth of a trillionth, a trillionth of a second. And that's when the actual universe was that big. And what we call our present universe was just, just that, that size. 
And that's the era when we believe that many of the important uh, uh, processes were imprinted. And it's a challenge to think of some indirect way in which we can get uh, uh, an observational or empirical handle on this extreme physics. Well, um, just uh, I put up this hazard warning sign because I want to uh, uh, just spend the next few minutes on some slightly more speculative issues. Um, one important question is how extensive is the physical reality within the remit of science? Now, I've already said that we can see huge numbers of galaxies. We can see galaxies out to uh, uh, about 10 billion light years. But there's a limit to what we can see because light hasn't had time to reach us um, from beyond a certain distance because the universe has a finite age. And just as if you're in the middle of the ocean, there's a horizon around you, but you don't think the ocean stops at your horizon, the same may be true of the universe. And most of us suspect that there is a lot more to our universe than the huge volume we can see. In fact, I think most of us would bet that it goes on thousands of times further. The reason for that is that if we look as far as we can in that direction and in that direction, the differences are only one part in 100,000. So if there's any sort of gradient towards an edge, then it's a very, very gentle gradient. But the universe could go on far, far further still, not to, to 10 to the power 100 light years, or even far, far more than that. It could even go on so far that all combinatory options are fulfilled and that uh, there's another Earth uh, where um, uh, there's another set of people in a lecture room like this. You know, that happens in principle uh, if the universe goes, it goes on far enough. But this, of course, let me emphasize, is far, far, far beyond uh, what uh, uh, we can ever directly observe. And even that's not all, because what I've talked about now is the aftermath of our Big Bang, as it were. But some people think that our Big Bang was not the only one and could be other completely disjoint space-times. One idea is what goes under the name of brain worlds. The analogy here is, suppose you imagine a whole lot of um, uh, uh, ants crawling around on a sheet of paper. That's their two-dimensional universe. They might be unaware of another set of ants on a parallel sheet of paper. Now, one dimension up, we may be in a, a similar uh, situation in that there could be another universe just that far away from ours. But if that distance is measured in some fourth spatial dimension and we're imprisoned in R3, then we wouldn't know about it. And that's a possibility. Another idea uh, is that uh, um, these, um, uh, it's almost like a vast version of Fred Hoyle's old steady state universe where um, um, big bangs are happening um, in a very complicated way, symbolized in this sort of cartoon. So what we think of as our, our universe with our horizon a lot beyond is just one sort of uh, bubble, and there are a whole lot of others. And this is an idea which uh, um, is taken quite seriously, and it raises the other question about um, uh, if there are many Big Bangs, um, then would they all be governed by the same laws? Because we know that the uh, physical laws um, that prevail on uh, Earth and in the lab are the same as in a distant galaxy. Uh, we know that uh, if you take the spectrum of the light of a galaxy, the hydrogen atoms, oxygen atoms are just the same. But of course, on this still vaster scale, that may not be the case. And it could be that uh, um, our laws are sort of fine tuned in a way that doesn't happen in some of the other universes. So, uh, this is uh, again a speculation. If I wanted a logo for my uh, uh, research area. I'd pick this one, an Ouroboros. It depicts the interconnectedness of the uh, micro world on the left and the cosmos on the right. And there are lots of links between the very small and the very large. Our everyday world of life and mountains is determined by atomic physics and chemistry. Stars halfway up on the right derive their energy from the nuclei within those atoms, halfway up on the left. And though I haven't had time to describe it, galaxies are held together by the gravity not just of what we see, but of dark matter, which is a set of particles, subnuclear particles made in the Big Bang. So there is a, a link there as well. The left-hand side, the micro-world, is the domain of the quantum. 
The right-hand side is the domain of gravity and Einstein's theory. And to just think about 20th century physics, the two great highlights were Einstein's theory of gravity and the quantum theory. And these haven't yet been meshed together. That doesn't actually matter very much because uh, if you're a chemist, you don't worry about the gravitational force between two atoms in your molecule because that's about 40 powers of 10 weaker than electric forces. On the other hand, if you're an astronomer trying to work out the orbits of planets or stars, then you don't worry about the fuzziness induced by quantum mechanics because uh, everything is so big that that's uh, unimportant. But conceptually, one does want to mesh these together. And the context where we need that unification is the one symbolized, as we were, gastronomically at the top of the picture uh, when uh, um, the entire universe is squeezed to the tiny size I mentioned because then quantum fluctuation could, as it were, shake the entire universe and we won't be able to fully understand uh, those processes until we have a theory uh, which uh, uh, unifies um, the quantum world with the space and time uh, ideas of Einstein. And that is a challenge, unfinished business for physicists. But before leaving this diagram, I want to emphasize something else, which is that um, not only do we want to link the very large and the very small at the top, but to the third frontier, the very complicated. And that's emphasized by what's at the bottom, namely us. We are the most complicated things in the universe, and uh, we are neither as small as atoms nor as large as stars. And we are complicated to an extent that we are the main challenge to science. In fact, uh, um, I show here, um, this, this is uh, a drawing by Isaac Newton's least favorite FRS, uh, Robert Hooke. This is his first picture of a flea taken through a microscope. And I want to say this, show this because uh, even a flea is far more complicated than an atom or a star because there's layer upon layer of intricate structure in, in something like this. And uh, that is why uh, most scientists work neither on the very small on the left nor on the very large on the right, but on the very complex. That is the uh, greatest of all challenges uh, to science. And incidentally, we are, as human beings, midway between the atoms and the stars. Um, if you, it would take about as many human bodies to make up the sun as there are atoms in each of us. The geometric mean of the mass of a proton and the mass of a uh, the sun is 50 kilograms, within a factor of two, I guess, of the mass of most people in this audience. So we are uh, midway, and uh, to understand ourselves, we have to understand the atoms we're made of, but we also have to understand the stars that made those atoms. Well, finally, I want to draw back from the cosmos, or from what may even be a vast array of cosmoses governed by different laws, and focus closer to the here and now. I'm often asked, is there a special perspective that astronomers can offer to science and philosophy? Well, first of all, obviously, we view our home planet in a vast cosmic context. And in the coming decades, we'll learn where there's life out there. So we can think about vast spatial extents. And incidentally, um, that doesn't make us any more serene. People say, does the fact that I think about these um, Enormous uh, arrays make me uh, more serene about everyday matters, but I have to say I worry just as much about tomorrow and next week as uh, anyone else does. But more seriously, I think astronomers can offer a special perspective in a sense of an awareness of an immense future. The stupendous time spans of the historic past, the evolutionary past, are part of common culture unless you're in Kansas or Alaska or some places like that, where perhaps they aren't, but uh, apart from that, we're all aware that we're the outcome of four billion years of evolution on Earth. But I think even those of us who are um, familiar with this tend to feel that somehow we humans are the end of the process, we're the culmination of it. But that hardly seems credible to any astronomer. 
That's because, as this crude time lapse, which shows the formation of the, 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 the sun and its eventual death, the sun is less than halfway through its life. It's been shining for four and a half billion years. It will be another six billion before it runs out of fuel and, and flares up. And the expanding universe will continue perhaps forever. To quote Woody Allen, eternity is very long, especially towards the end. <laughs> and any creature witnessing the sun's demise six billion years hence won't be human. They'll be as different from us as we are from a bug, because there's been more time for evolution between now and then than there has up till now. So post-human evolution here on Earth and far beyond could be as prolonged as the Darwinian evolution has led to us and even more wonderful. And Darwin himself uh, thought about this a bit. One quote from, from him. And incidentally, uh, the future evolution may well be even faster uh, than natural selection where it takes a million years for a species to evolve. This evolution may take place on the technological timescale of genetics or of machines taking over. And levels of intelligence or insight may allow future beings to address questions we can't even pose. Just as quantum mechanics may flummox a chimpanzee, uh, there may be some of these important questions which will not be understood uh, by human brains at all. Well, back a bit closer to the Earth, we're all familiar with this picture of our planet from space. I showed it at the beginning where the Earth's delicate biosphere contrasts with the sterile moonscape where the astronauts left their footprints. And we've had these images for about 40 years. But suppose some aliens had been watching our planet for its entire history, these four and a half billion years. What would they have seen? Over nearly all that immense time, the Earth's appearance would have changed very gradually. The continents drifted, the ice cover waxed and waned, successive species emerged, evolved and became extinct. But in just a tiny sliver of the Earth's history, the last one millionth part, that's just a few thousand years, they would have seen the patterns of vegetation start to alter much faster than before. This signaled, of course, the start of agriculture and the appearance of human beings on the scene. And the pace of change would be seen to accelerate as human populations grew. And then these aliens watching us would have seen even more abrupt changes. Within 50 years, little more than one hundredth of one millionth of the Earth's age, the carbon dioxide in the Earth's atmosphere began to rise enormously fast. The planet became an intense emitter of radio waves, the total output from all TV stations and radars. And something else unprecedented happened. Small projectiles launched from the Earth's surface escaped the biosphere completely. They went into orbit, they went to the moon or to the planets and beyond. Well, if they understood astrophysics, the aliens could confidently have predicted that the biosphere would face doom in a few billion years when the sun flares up and dies. But could they have predicted this unprecedented runaway fever less than halfway through the Earth's life? So this indicates that even in the sort of concertinaed timeline, extending billions of years into the future as well as into the past, this century is a rather special one. It's the first in our planet's history where one species, ours, can really change Earth's entire future and could indeed jeopardize life's immense potential. And I think... What happens in future will obviously depend on whether we do evolve sustainably, whether some of these projectiles launched from the Earth do establish independent communities away, uh, or whether uh, there is a sort of spasm followed by silence as perceived by these aliens. So it's clear that what happens is going to depend on us and that this pale blue dot in the cosmos is a special place may be a unique place, and also that we are its stewards at a especially crucial time, especially crucial century. And that, I think, is a message for all of us, whether we're interested in astronomy or not. So thank you very much. <laughs>